I'm here today to tell you why I think that the Cenozoic is the most awesome part of South Australia's fossil record. So the Cenozoic is when our continent became the Australia that we know today. So 66 million years ago, when the Cenozoic rolled around, around about three quarters of the plant and animal species on Earth had been wiped out by the KPG extinction event. And this left, left a whole lot of vacated niches for animals to move into. And so marsupials and their relatives came down from South America through Antarctica and reached Australia by about 65 million years ago. And then by 30 million years ago, Antarctica and Australia separated and Australia went north towards more favourable conditions at the equator. So on board Australia were most of the vertebrate families that would diversify into our marsupial dominated fauna. And as we drifted closer towards Asia, we picked up some new animals. We picked up new reptile families and we picked up rodents. So really, everything that the others have spoken about today has led to this moment now. The evolution of Cenozoic Australia as we know it and live in it today. And as you can see on this map here, South Australia has got an outstanding and extensive Cenozoic fossil record. And it's critical for us to understand the evolution and diversification of our modern vertebrate groups. So in the Namba and the Etadunna formations, we've got rich fossil deposits with a huge variety of different faunas. And they're about 25 million years old. And so this means that these sites can tell us a lot about the evolutionary beginnings of our early and our modern Australian fauna. At the Warburton River, Northern Lakes and Karamolka Town Cave, we've got Pliocene faunas aged around about 5.3 to 2.5 million years old. And these faunas are important to show us how different animals diversified and evolved in response to climate change. Then there's the Narracourt Caves, South Australia's only World Heritage listed fossil site. And they contain one of the longest and most complete records of mid to late Pleistocene vertebrates from anywhere in the world. And this record can tell us a lot about how animals were able to respond to changing climates. So what happened to them through glacial and interglacial cycles. And at Lake Calabona, animals like Beringa and Diprotodon perished in the mud on the side of a drying lake in the late Pleistocene. Now some of these articulated skeletons even have joeys in the pouches. And the preservation is so good that we've got footprints, we've got impressions of skin, fur and feathers. We can see what these animals really did look like. And there's even gut contents preserved. We can see what they were eating just before they died. And we had iconic megafaunal species in the Cenozoic that went extinct by about 40,000 years ago, like Thylacaleo, 100 kilogram marsupial predator, and it took its herbivore origins and evolved into an absolutely highly specialised killing machine. So those hook claws and those specialised teeth, Thylacaleo was using these to take down large prey, probably kangaroos, and it could climb too. So it was probably dropping on its prey from overhanging branches. It was Australia's true drop there. We had giant kangaroos, Procoptodon goliath, two metres tall and over 200 kilograms. So in comparison, a large red kangaroo might stand one and a half metres tall and it might weigh 90 kilograms. And check out those teeth. Procoptodon was using these to process some really tough vegetative matter, like saltbush. And there was Megalania, our huge reptilian predator. Now, it was possibly up to about four times the size of the Komodo dragon, and like the Komodo, it was probably venomous too, which is, of course, not very good news for, for our friend Genionis there. Now, Genionis was the last of an ancient lineage of birds, and it was an absolute giant amongst Pleistocene birds. It weighed around 250 kilos, but it had these absolutely ridiculous, tiny, and utterly pointless wings. And then there's Diprotodon, our large herbivorous marsupial. It weighed around about, um, weighed over two tonnes and it had a backwards facing pouch that could carry its young in. And it was not just a giant wombat. Taxonomically, it isn't even in the same family as wombats. And you've got to remember, these are not just abstract animals from our distant past. These are animals that we're still connected to today. 
and there are rich oral traditions from Australia's First Nations people that have recorded real memories and interactions with these megafaunal species. So, for example, the Billy Warrena people of the Western Flinders Ranges have a story about Diprotodon. Now, they talk about a giant and very grumpy herbivore that they call Yamati. Now, Yamati could kill a person with its two front teeth if you provoked it hard enough. Now, Australia still maintains an incredible Cenozoic fauna, and it's unique. But our extinction rate is the fourth highest in the world. And for mammals, our extinction rate is the highest in the world. Now, what has this got to do with fossils, right? Well, by studying these animals in the Cenozoic fossil record, we can look at how conditions in the past affected them. And we can use this information to help us predict and manage these animals through our changing climate today. Now, given the state of the world's climate right now, this is really important stuff. So Cenozoic paleontology, it's not just paleontology. It's useful paleontology and it's relevant now. And it most certainly is not just gardening. So if these alone haven't convinced you that the Cenozoic fossil record is the most awesome in South Australia, then, then there's one more. I've got one more thing to throw at you. The Cenozoic has something that is completely unparalleled by any other of these time periods. The Cenozoic has got the cute, huggable, warm and totally adorable mammal fluff. And that is pretty awesome. <laughs> Then let down from the trees With sharpened points and claws that brought Its prey down to its knees Die like a Leo Like a Leo, whoa, whoa.